Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for an informational webinar on the recently released RFA titled State Dementia Care Research Center. I'm Elena Fazio. I'm a program official in the National Institute on Aging's Division of Behavioral and Social Researcher, Research. Excuse me. I would like to thank the NIA program staff who have helped tremendously with putting together the RFA in today's webinar, including John Phillips, Partha Bhattacharya, Priscilla Novak, Emerald Nguyen, Teresa Kim, Kate Lee, Laura Major, Nicole Kidweiler, and Liz Wiggins. I would also like to acknowledge and thank our NIA Division of Extramural Activities and Scientific and Re Review and Budget staff for making this RFA possible. Next slide. This webinar will be recorded and shared with the public. Of note to you, the public may incord, include those who actually want to um, be collaborators on potential applications. So do keep in mind that the public will have access to, including you, this webinar within probably a week's time. A list of frequently asked questions or FAQs will also be posted alongside the webinar recording. Your questions today may in fact inform parts of that FAQ. Next slide. At the end of today's presentation, we'll have time for questions. Audience questions will be addressed at that time. And in addition to that final time, if you'd like to put your own questions in chat throughout the course of the presentation, please go ahead and do so. But it will be during the Q&A that we'll ask you to raise your electronic hand. And once recognized, we'll ask you to unmute and speak your question aloud. At that point, feel free to introduce yourself and the questions that you say out loud um, will, of course, as I mentioned, be a part of the recording. If you only have questions in the chat, they won't be a part of the recording, so we will go ahead and read them out loud. Next slide. So the purpose of this webinar is to present the contents of the Notice of Funding Opportunity and to answer questions from the research community regarding RFA AG 24033, again, the State Dementia Care Research Center. Next slide. The following presentation will highlight key elements of the RFA and include topics such as background and RFA purpose, research objectives, organizational structure, research strategy, non-responsiveness criteria, review criteria, key dates, and then as I said, we'll end with Q&A. Everything you hear today is included in the actual RFA itself, but is hopefully presented in a way that helps to clarify some of your potential questions. Next slide. So we're gonna begin with a discussion of background and the gap that is being filled by this proposed RFA. There is an urgent need to better understand what works in terms of AD, ADRD, or more accurately described, Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease related dementias care coordination, integration, and transitions in community settings across the US. However, existing efforts have been focused primarily on the national level and have left many research and research infrastructure gaps. So because of this, we are turning to the state and local level. A state or regional approach should include inputs from multiple stakeholders that can provide much needed insights on what works, for whom, and in terms of what type of dementia care. The engagement of healthcare systems and social service systems and their providers at the state and sub-state level are critical to scientific advancements in this area. Next slide. The RFA invites applications for a state dementia care research center that aims to ultimately improve care for those living with dementia and their care partners by building a research evidence base that can be used to improve dementia care coordination, integration, and care transitions in community settings as well as to inform policymaking. With recognition of the differences in provision, coverage, and access to dementia care across the nation, this infrastructure resource will support research on social services and health systems within states. The new resource will invite research on dementia care coordination, integration, and transitions within states. It will foster the creation and integration of data on home and community-based services and healthcare data within states and importantly, will support the dissemination of findings to stakeholders, the public, and policymakers. Next slide. The stated research objectives are shown here. 
One objective is to address data and measurement to support research exploiting state and regional differences. Another objective is to build research supporting partnerships. A third is to disseminate the res results. And a fourth is to bring together scientists and community stakeholders from across settings. An additional research objective is to overcome existing research and data limitations by integrating program data with Medicare and Medicaid data within states to identify approaches that improve dementia care access, cost of care, and quality of care. Next slide. So here you see the org organizational structure of this set proposed center or U54. The administrative and dementia core will oversee the administration or, or another way to say it is the operations of the center which means basically that the administrative and dissemination core will make connections across the other cores. And this core will also work to disseminate research findings to a wide range of stakeholders and promote use of center developed tools and infrastructure by the broader research and stakeholder communities. Another core, the partnership and engagement core has two goals. One is to establish state-based partnerships. And the second is to encourage stakeholder engagement through a persons living with dementia and care partner engagement panel. The core will build partnerships with institutions and, and programs. For example, an, an institution could be a home health agency or some public health program with states to obtain access to program and other relevant data and to facilitate research aiming to support likely five to seven states over the course of what we imagine will be approximately a five-year award. Engagement in this core will mean it will, the engagement part of the core will stand up a persons living with dementia and care partner engagement panel. Applicants may propose that other individuals or organizations be a part of this engagement panel, such as, for example, paid caregivers. Now moving to the data core. The data core will coordinate knowledge about data used by individual projects and may act as a data or code repository where applicable. I'll say more about that later. The research and pilot core will stimulate rigorous reproducible research on topics that deepen our understanding of what works in terms of dementia care coordination, integration, and transitions. The research or pilot projects must use data or resources associated with the center, and the research topics must focus on policy or contextual factors that influence successful or unsuccessful dementia care coordination, transitions, and integration. Care transitions is one area of potential research. So to give you an idea of the types of topics that the center might address, they could include a focus on care transitions for persons living with dementia across community settings, or perhaps the economics or payment of care transitions and Medicare advantage or plan variation. There should also be an external advisory panel. The panel is set up to ensure that the center achieves its objectives under what is considered a cooperative agreement. The external advisory panel will be comprised of independent scientific ex experts in areas appropriate to the multidisciplinary content of this particular center. The EAP will do a number of things. A couple of examples are to report to NIA and communicate specific recommendations to NIA regarding priorities. Another is to review and comment on the conduct of the center aims and discuss progress in meeting the innovation and dissemination goals. Next slide. I'd like to encourage you at this point to read, of course, the entire RFA with special attention to the instructions laid out in section four of the RFA. There are additional requirements that are not listed on this slide. But in terms of an overview, we expect that applications will address the objectives and long-term goals of the center. And we expect that applications will start by proposing at a minimum two states that, or two state entities that would work in collaboration with each other and be thoughtful about future collaborations that will be necessary to maintain the center. Applications should also think about sustainability plans, that is, plans to make sure that the infrastructure and its associated resources can continue after the award is completed. Applications should also describe how the center will engage nationally 
with others working in similar areas. And you'll see some of those potential other groups listed here. I'd also like to mention at this point that one of the goals of this effort is to look at or compare research across states. So the center and the overall strategy should attend to this thought that is comparison across states. Next slide. I mentioned the cores earlier. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on each of them now. So the administrative and data dissemination core should include activities such as a public website, the arrangement of meetings, as well as making sure that the goals of the overall center are being met. This particular administration and dissemination core should focus on logistics and communication materials, as well as producing progress reports. Importantly, an, an important part of the core is dissemination. So activities should include processes for disseminating research and data findings. This core would be responsible for hosting center webinars and for offering input for data infrastructure building. Next slide. Now we turn again to the partnership and engagement core. As I mentioned on a prior slide, the Partnership Engagement Corps has two essential goals. The first is to establish state-based partnerships, and the second is to encourage stakeholder engagement through a Persons Living with Dementia and Care Partner Engagement Panel. Required activities include state-based and sub-state-based partnerships to capture program data and support growing engagement of key stakeholders, as well as to engage with a wide range of stakeholders and stakeholder engagements. In addition, activities include integrating stakeholder feedback to better understand state level policies, to re return results to communities of stakeholders, and to coordinate with the administrative court as they think about governance of the overall center. And, it, and a final required activity noted here is the stakeholder engagement group that's been mentioned a few times. Next slide. The data core will essentially coordinate knowledge about data in potentially three different ways. As part of the data core, applicants must think about and attend to three different data streams. The first is person level primary data collection. Though this potential focus is probably less obvious than the two to follow, it is possible that the data core might support primary data collection from persons living with dementia, caregivers, and or health systems. A second stream of data would be existing data files that are maintained by the state entities or the center. So data files may be maintained by the states or sub-state entities themselves and not directly shared with the data core. However, in this case, a process should be described to allow all center affiliates access to these data. So basically this second stream has to do with data access. The third data stream has to do with state policy variation. Uh, a unique and important feature of the center is its ability to compare state level policies over time. One source of data will be state specific dementia care coordination and integration policies. So this part of the core should be mindful of state policy variation and associated data. Across all three data streams, within one month of the start of years two through five of the award, the investigators must provide a timeline for when public and or restricted data will be available for research use. Next slide. The research slash pilot core has some required activities that include soliciting and reviewing the actual applications for research and pilot core um, research projects. So basically this core has to figure out and propose a way to solicit and review such applications to see if there are any meritorious projects. This core should also describe how these awards once made will be managed and will be thoughtful about disseminations of, dissemination of findings. Research slash pilot opportunities or projects should be designed to inform AD, ADRD research implementation milestones. Many of you are familiar with these milestones that are derived from our dementia-focused research summits supported through NIA and NIH more broadly. Applications for research or pilot projects must be solicited and submitted in year one of the center award 
selected projects will conduct their research across years two through five of the center. Research projects may not exceed $100,000 in direct costs per project and $800,000 in total costs per year starting in year one. Next slide. Of course, in an RFA, it's always important to look at the non-responsiveness criteria. So the following types of applications will be considered non-responsive and will be withdrawn prior to review. That is applications that do not propose all required cores, that do not focus on dementia care populations, data and research, that do not address forming research partnerships within institutions and across organizations at the state or sub state level, including, as I mentioned before, at least two initial partnerships and applications that do not include populations that experience dementia care disparities and inequities as described in the NIA Health Disparities Research Framework. Next slide. Applicants are strongly encouraged to read the Notice of Funding Opportunity Announcement and the specific questions that apply to the five score driving criteria for the overall project. They're not all listed here. Here are a couple of examples, but those criteria include investigator expertise, as well as under the approach, whether or not the proposed application will lead to a dynamic infrastructure that will support the goals of the proposed effort. Next slide. So here are the project details and key dates. NIA intends to commit $4 million in fiscal year 2024 to fund one award. It'll be a U54 cooperative agreement award. The application budgets are limited to 2.5 million in direct cost per year. And they of course need to reflect the actual needs of the proposed project. The scope of the proposed projects to determine the project period. The maximum project period is five years. To the right, you'll see the key dates. First, the letters of intent are due October 14th. I'll say more about that on the next slide. The actual application due date is November 14th, 2023, with a planned scientific merit review of March of next year, an advisory council in May, and an earliest start date of July, 2024. Next slide. So, some of you are familiar with letters of intent. They are not required and they're not binding, but you sending them to us makes life a lot more easy, particularly for our review colleagues. So we ask that you do go ahead and send a letter of intent if you plan to apply. Those letters of intent should come to me, Elena Fazio, at my email address noted here. And those letter of intent messages should include a description of your proposed activity, the names, addresses, and telephone numbers of, of investigators, as well as the names of key personnel, participating institutions, and the number and title of the funding opportunity announcement. So now we're gonna to turn to questions. During the Q&A or questions and answer period, please raise your electronic hand. And once recognized, you can go ahead and unmute and speak your question out loud. Feel free to introduce yourself when you ask your questions. Those questions not shared aloud by audience members, but included in the chat will be read out loud by NIA staff. So let's turn now to Q&A and thank you so far, so much so far for your attention. Oh, okay. Sorry, that took me a minute. Olga, go ahead. Hi, this is Olga Hattarin from Rutgers State University, New Jersey. I bet a like a clarification question on the slide where you showed about the pilot funding. It looked like the pilot grants um, might be awarded in the second year and continue for four years, but in the program announcement, it looked like the pilot awards could only be one year without approval. Can you oh. clarify? Thanks, Olga. Good to see you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the, the actual pilot or research project should only go for a year, but we anticipate potential funding um, in sort of cycles, if you will, that's a certain number would be um, funded in one year and then and they would last for one year. So the, the duration would be one year and then another a set of folks could apply for one year of funding in, in the years um, subsequent. So yes, they are only one year Pilot or Research Awards. Thanks, Olga. Thank you.
I'm not seeing any other questions, Alina. Hey, we, um, oh, go ahead. Thank you. This is Naoko Muramatsu at the University of Illinois, Chicago. <clears throat> Uh, states vary in terms of how open they are in terms of data sharing, and some states do not allow uh, their data to be used for purposes other than the contract uh, uh, that is instituted. And so I'm wondering whether, you know, uh, like a studying, what are some challenges for states to you know, share data. Is that a part of this initiative or not? Because there are certain states that are easier to do that kind of uh, research and then they will be kind of more advanced. And I'm wondering whether addressing or identifying the barriers and addressing those questions uh, can be addressed in, in this initiative. Thanks for your question, Ayoko. Um, so in terms of what I can say about the RFA, we um, part of the intention is to look at variation across states. So I would suggest to you and any other potential applicants that you include that conversation about potentially different experiences with data and otherwise across states as part of your application. Um, I, I don't think that would be outside of what we could um, consider you know part of an application i can't give you more of a direct answer than that but um we do anticipate some variation thanks naoko um i did see walter's hand go up you want to go ahead and then joey can sure go ahead, i think hi uh walt dawson oregon health and science university i just wanted to clarify um two partners are needed to be responsive, that's right. And that can be either across states or within a state or does, or or both, are both options possible? Thanks so much for that question, Walter. I know it's uh, a bit confusing. Just to be very direct, um, in order to apply, you have to have a minimum of basically two states, right? So we don't want, we're not looking for an application that has everybody um, all of the participants from one state. So we say a minimum of two, you would need to have um, representation from at least two states. Thank you. And then uh, maybe I'll just take a moment to add to that, Walter, that um, over time, the part of the imperative is to um, have the, the, the partnership core be thoughtful about reaching out to other partners. And so the hope would be that over time that the what may only start out as two states, it could be more, um, would would turn into more potentially, you know, five to seven, for example, over time. It isn't our ex expectation that all 50 states or territories would become a part of the of the center. Um, but we do hope that the number of partnerships and states will grow and that, as I mentioned, um, that comparisons across states or regions can be made because we see that as part of the value of the RFA and the call to you for applications. Thank you. Joey, go ahead. You can unmute, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Joey Mattingly, University of Utah. Um, quick question about the uh, external advisory board. Um, I, I think when I was initially thinking about reading through the RFA that uh, our external advisory board would be built throughout that partnership and engagement core. But now as I'm kind of reading it, maybe that's uh, a little bit differently or maybe we're using the, those terms separately. So is that external advisory board experts combined with like subject matter experts from the NIA? Another great question. Thank you so much. So um, uh, let me see if I can clarify this. I'm gonna take sort of the engagement piece first that in the partnership engagement core, the engagement piece is looking at people living with dementia, family care, care partners and others to really provide, be a sort of a standing panel to inform um, the research, the, the conversation, et cetera. And, and uh, the PI team would you know, be uh, standing up that group and, and using um, their input to the best of their ability. The external advisory pa uh, panel, and I'm my apologies if I am getting the, the name a little bit wrong, is a group that has to be um, uh, sort of approved by NIA. It would, um, so it would have 
um, perhaps a program officer, but primarily um, external uh, advisors, experts, for example, let's say in like biostat stats or something of that sort. So the, the external advisory panel is the NIA pre approved group that is um, giving more of a, of a scientific and sort of like progress kind of uh, lens where the engagement panel is 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 something different. And I and I should say that the panel, the external advisory panel, will be formed after the award. And you, if you haven't seen it in the RFA, it notes that you should not propose board members for your application. That um, creates some challenges that you don't want. So again, uh, that panel will be formed afterwards and you should not mention the names of those potential uh, panelists in your application. Great, that was gonna be my follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> Great, excellent. Does anyone else have any questions? Harrison, go ahead. Hi, um, this is a wonderful proposal. Thank you, um, I mean, uh, Paul, thank you very much for this. Um, what I wanted to know is when we think about our um, our core groups, should we be thinking about them then as cross-state cores instead of a within-state core um, that reaches out to another state? It, should that be balanced is, I guess, my question. Another good question. We are going to um, turn that to you as the applicant to propose what you think makes the most sense in terms of advancing the science. Um, so you can construct and and propose the cores in terms in terms of their composition in any way that you would like. Um, I think that the spirit of uh, partnership and collaboration should inform how you propose the participants of those cores. But I, we leave that to you to make that. Um, offering. And I also just want to um, go back for a second to sort of add to um, the prior conversation. Um, I, I wanted to remind you all that you should, in your application, describe the process and how you will interact with the board, the external advisory board or panel, that, that prior question, um, as part of your governance plan. So this isn't, Harrison, the same question that you were asking, but sort of meld some of the stuff together, which is that, you know, in your application, again, you should describe how you think certain things should happen. And in the case of the um, administrative core um, at working with the other cores, you should develop a governance plan that that the administrative core would, you know, that would tells you how the different cores will interact, sort of guided by the administrative core, which is kind of the connective tissue across the other cores. Does anyone else have questions for Elena? Quincy, go ahead. Thanks. So, <clears throat> thank you so much for this uh, great information. So, uh, one question about the the budget: um, is, since this is a cooperative agreement, is it is it allowable for um, portions of the budget to go to states um, to assist with their data infrastructure building uh, through this mechanism? Quincy, that's a great question. I, I'm not able to give you um, an answer right now, but I'll make sure that we include that in the FAQs. Um, and if you uh, if you have anything in, in greater with greater specificity, feel free to send me an email. You'll see my email address come up. But that's um, a good question at, that I um, will refer you generally to the RFA, but I, I'll have to get back to you on, on the specifics of that. Thank you. Any other questions for Elena? Hey, while we wait, I'm gonna ask Nicole to advance the slide to um, our contact information. Um, and uh, I'm also just wanting to um, let you know, um, Quincy, that I'm reminded by one of my colleagues that in the RFA, it talks about eligible organizations. Um, so, um, you know, that may help you not with perhaps your direct question, but with um, with other questions that are related around uh, who are eligible to participate in the overall um, center. Um, so, oh. Um, Richard, do you have a question? Yeah, hello. Yep. Uh, 
A question about the solicitation for the pilot studies. Is that pretty much up to the discretion of the applicant as to whether the solicitation might be within a state or within at least two states or even national? Is that, is that pretty much uh, flexible? Um, thanks for that question, uh, Rick. Yes. So we're asking you as the applicant to propose what you think is the most effective um, process for uh, for soliciting and reviewing slash approving applications. And, and because this is a cooperative agreement, um, there is a high likelihood that you would end up working in, you know, in concert with um, NIA staff to, to um, finalize that process. But yes, you should be um, you should be putting forward your suggestion for how you think it's best to solicit, review, and ultimately select meritorious uh, pilot or research projects. Great. Thanks, Elena. Sure. Naoko, you can go again. Thanks. Yes. Uh, one more question. So the the total amount is 2.5 million, and then the um, a pilot uh, total cost would be 800,000, meaning 2.5 minus 800,000 would be the uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, applicants kind of uh, total cost. Or the direct cost, right? So the, you can't mm -hmm. um, in any given year the total dollars for mm -hmm. the pilot should not exceed eight hundred thousand dollars, and yes, that's right. a, a substantial part of the overall budget. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Elena? Um, I will end then with um, a thank you for your, um, oh, I see one more question, oh. Kate. Uh, Regina, go ahead, thanks. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> this is Regina Shi, um, I'm at Emory University. I, heard, I think I heard you mention earlier, uh, Elena, that the pilots have to make use of the data that is provided in the data core. Um, does that mean that pilots are not allowed to apply using data that is not part of the two or more states that are proposed in any given year? That is a great question, Regina. I can tell you the spirit in which we um, it's written in the RFA. I'm, go I'm gonna get back to you on that and put it in the FAQs because we, I don't think, um, I, I need to think through the specifics. Um, and if, if you wouldn't mind, Regina, um, following up with me by email with your specific question, that would be really helpful. Sure, thanks. But I, I will say in terms of the of the spirit of it, the intention is that, you know, that the, the overall U52, U54, the center, you know, provides something unique for, for participants. And so we, we do hope that the bringing together of data will be a key feature and will drive, you know, researchers to participate in the center and then it will amplify the the value of the center. So it, the spirit is to have folks participate and use the resources of the center um, in collaboration with each other. Um, so I think we're I think we're okay on questions. Um, you'll see on screen my name and um, my colleagues, Nicole and Kate, who can, you can email us. Please do include the RFA number in the subject line. We get a lot of emails. Um, it's not always clear exactly uh, the correct audience and path forward. So please do identify the RFA number. Um, and we will uh, hope to have the recording of this webinar up uh, relatively soon with the FAQ. Um, and again, this is public. so. Um, people who are watching this later um, will hopefully have this uh, the same access to the information you had here today. Uh, and we thank you for, you know, hopefully your um, your applications. And uh, we do want collaboration. So uh, we, we look forward to seeing the 
the, the teams that you build in your applications. And um, just as a reminder, uh, letter of intent, it's um, uh, just under a month from now that it'd be helpful if you can let us know that you're planning to apply. And then the application deadline is in mid-November. Um, so please um, hold tight to those, um, those dates. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Have a good day, everybody.